This week, confidence while driving an RV. Do you have anxiety? Are you concerned about driving an RV for the first time? We're gonna talk about some tips and tricks to help you get over that a little bit. Plus, is RVing actually cheaper than other types of vacations? There's a new study out that's gonna give us some info on that. This is RV Miles. Welcome to episode number 315 of RV Miles. I'm Jason. And I'm Abby. And here at RV Miles, we are two RVers who have been enjoying the RV lifestyle since 2016. Around these parts, we like to talk about all things RV and outdoors, including industry news, travel destinations, our national parks, and so much more. Y'all, it's snowing outside our window right now. It is snowing. <laughs> and it is April 2nd. Which is not totally out of the norm for the Midwest here, but you know we've had some days of rain recently it's been a little gloomy. We, of course, we did have like 70 degree days in February, so we were a little spoiled, but now it's snowing again. Well, for seven and a half years, this is not where we were in April. So True. this is quite a shock to True. the system. Normally by this time, we were somewhere much warmer, enjoying a lot of sun. Here, the sun doesn't really like to come out and play. So uh, vitamin D is your friend when you live in the Midwest, for sure. So this is a bit of a kick to the system to be sitting here on April 2nd. This is no April Fool's. Like, I feel like Mother Nature's a day late with the jokes. And this is this is a little intense for me. And this is today <laughs> and tomorrow. This is supposed Next to stick Next week around. is supposed to be beautiful for us, though. Believe uh, it when I see it, Jay. But we are feeling the itch to get yeah. camping again it was one of the questions that came up in our mile marker live stream last night where we we share um just sort of a more intimate conversation with uh the folks in the mile marker community if you want to consider becoming a mile marker you should you get extra podcast episodes and discount on our upcoming homecoming rally in Amanda, iowa this october which just went on sale to mile marker members they get sort of a two week advance and they get 25 dollars off of the ticket so if you're a couple mile marker membership for the year is $70. So for the two of you, you're getting $50 off homecoming. So it's basically like you get mile marker membership for 20 bucks. So you might want to consider doing that, but um, we've already got a bunch of sign up, So we're excited to uh, get that on sale to the general public in a few days. What's the actual date that it goes on sale at the, for the public? Well, everyone's, uh, everyone's second favorite, favorite day. day in April, and that <laughs> would be day. tax day, <laughs> April 15th. So it will go on sale. Then tickets will be $225 per person. Kids are always free. 17 and under is free. We will still feed them, but you do not need to pay for them to come to an yeah. RV Miles event. So it's $200 for an adult. If you're a mile marker member, like Jason said, 225 for the general public. It is really shaping up to be such a fun event. We have really talked a lot with our mile marker members. Many of them were there last year and they have offered some really great suggestions. Even as late as last night, we were still getting some awesome ideas to really make this event that is for the community, about the community, and designed for all of us to come together and celebrate what we love about RVing and wrap up another RV season, which for us cannot get started fast enough. I, you mentioned having the itch to travel and boy, that is really, really deep in us right now. I am stir crazy. Thank goodness. Restaurant week starts next week here in the quad city. So at least I can, <laughs> I'm going to go to all these restaurants for dinner, but like, we're kind of I, devoting the uh, weekends right now to building out the studio and getting the studio done. So we can't really like go just camp on the weekends or no. something like that. So hopefully once we get this done, we'll have more freedom. I think that's part that. of it. There's a lot of responsibility here right now. The kids are wrapping up a lot of their extracurricular activities as well. And so a lot of those result in performances. There's a lot of that extra that's happening right now. School is kind of starting, you know, we're all getting a little itchy with the homeschooling to start wrapping up for the season, even even though there's still at least a couple more months. <laughs> they got a while. Us, they got a while. Yeah, we do I, do sort of a traditional school year with the kids, but uh, we got some time. Well, and we've had, they've, you know, they get a little extra time off here and there. That's different than I think traditional school too. Obviously when we were in Tampa and they were with my parents, we 
did not ask my mom to take on a bulk of their education while that was happening. When we went to Seattle, we gave them a few days off with grandma and grandpa. So we have to put all of that onto the back end of the year to ensure that we stay on track. And so there's just this itch all around from all of us to just be out kind of back on the road or Ethan, you know, this is really interesting. I won't go too far into this, but Ethan said to us the other day, our Ethan is our 13 year old that he is missing, really missing the campground itself, the ability, you know, we're in an apartment right now, an apartment complex, and there's plenty of green space around there. And there's a park that's not far. And, but so we continue to look for what's going to be a more permanent home base. And, but he misses being able to just walk out the camp, the walk out the door of the RV and just be playing yeah. in the green space yeah. right there and doing his thing. And, the, and for him, you know, being able to just stop what he's doing and come in and eat because he's not like, you know, a couple blocks down at the playground to just be able to stop and come in and have that access to his inside and outside space. Because, you know, for a lot of our viewers and especially for us, we talked about this, that outside was inside and inside was outside. And that really got into Ethan's soul. I mean, he was five years old when we started six yeah. years old. So, you know, he is, he's missing that. And I, I really look forward to getting that kid back to a campground so that he can just go out there and be out there and sit out there on his computer and hang out and, and make, you know, that he just misses it. We all are missing it a lot. Well, as we ponder getting ready uh, to RV as the camping season sort of starts to begin here, they always say the official camping season begins around Memorial Day. Um, and I think it's a lot sooner for RVers. I think maybe that's more the official tent camping season for folks in the north. <laughs> of, course, of course, if you're in the south, like the summer is when you stop camping sometimes, right? They're like, that's um, the actual end of our camping season. We'll be back in October. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there, there's a new study out from the RV Industry Association. We're actually pulling this from uh, our friends at RV Today magazine. They did a good spread on this. If you haven't checked out RV Today, we actually have a article in it this we month do. on um, black tank health. Ten tank tips. Mm -hmm. So say that five times fast <laughs> as you're going over to RV well, we did. We actually did a podcast episode on this uh, as well a while back, but they've they've made a really wonderful spread of, of our tips out in, in the magazine. Of course, that's a, another bonus for being a Mile Marker member. Mm. You get a subscription to RV Today magazine. You do. And you know something I wanted to bring up about that, I'm glad mm. that you said that, is a subscription to RV Today also now includes the digital back catalog of all the RV campaigns magazines and that yeah, would allow you to go back and see bought, one that we were on <laughs> uh, they bought rv camping magazine yes um so they've got all of those those back issues as well yeah so this is a vacation cost comparison study done by the but by uh, an independent data firm hired by the rv industry association so yeah you can take, take it, it with a grain of salt because mm -hmm. it's the rv industry association but it was a third party that put this together and they're trying to compare the costs of rv travel versus air travel. The results are really, really interesting. So let's just take, uh, for instance, let's start with the Dallas to the Grand Canyon. So if you lived in Dallas and you wanted to go the, to the Grand Canyon area for 14 days uh, and a group of four people. So they did this all with a group of four people. So the total cost for travel, uh, if you're flying, including airfare, a rental car, and hotels, would be $8,801 on average for that trip. The total cost for travel in a Class C motorhome, and this includes your cost of ownership of the motorhome, mm -hmm. would be $5,627. Now, again, with a grain of salt, assume, though, that you're going to need to use your RV more in order for it to pay for itself. So not everybody can take a 14 day trip every year or even multiple times a year. And obviously if you're traveling with an RV, you're gonna wanna get the most use out of it. So you're gonna be trying to use it more often. And the more you do, the more you'll get out of it. And I think it's important to remember too, they don't specify in here, at least in this article. Now it could be if you, go to the report, maybe get a little bit deeper into it. But the cost also, when it comes to RVing, it doesn't take in or say 
what type of RV accommodations they're looking at. Are they looking at a private campground? Most likely they're looking at a private campground. Yeah, I think this is this is average accommodation. So yeah. it's not going to be the most expensive resort. It's not going to be the cheapest. But I think there is that opportunity, again, with the hotel. There are always that opportunity to play around a little bit with the numbers. Uh, yeah, flights it, can vary too, depending on if you're taking that prime time, you know, flight yeah. spot, or if you're going to do the red eye. If you're going to you're gonna fly Spirit, or yeah. or, <laughs> no, or you no need one. extra leg room like me. But I also <laughs> no, think, like, not you know, I, I think there is there is for me, and I know for you for sure, there is only a certain level of hotel anymore. That well, we're willing to accept. You and make it's me not, sound so bougie. No, it, it's, it's, it's is not, true. It, it is no, true. It, it's not an expense thing. It's not a. Uh, it, we're fine with like two or three star hotel. We don't need a lot of amenities. It just needs to be clean. nice and clean. That's the thing. I I do think that for a lot of us RVers, we become a little bit spoiled when we transfer to a hotel because we have become so accustomed to traveling in our own space with our own bed, our own clothes, our own bathroom, our own kitchen. And there is a level now, please do not assume that household Epperson is super clean, but I'm, there's a difference between my dirt versus someone I don't know who was just in this space and the dirt that they left, right? There's a difference between my hair on the pillow versus some stranger's hair on the pillow that you might find in a hotel room. And I, think for us that when we have gone to hotels over the last several years, there is a, a little bit of a level of elevated cleanliness yeah. that we're looking for having been RVers and traveling around for as long as we have been. So that does for us can sometimes elevate the cost a little bit when we travel. Yeah. And obviously I think the, the pandemic made a lot of people more, germophobic it, oh, it, for, for lack sure. of a better term. I, I, I know it did for me. Oh, I, I think too, um, you know, I'm always really super paranoid about bed bugs. And the first thing I do when I walk into a hotel is I walk right over to the bed. I pull the sheets. I look, I lift up the mattress. I do a whole scan. Well, what's crazy too is, you know, the pandemic caused sort of a labor shortage for a while and that caused hotels to stop doing sort of like the everyday cleaning. Yeah. And a lot of hotels haven't brought that back. No. A lot now of hotels, it's, it's just like upon request. Upon request, or if you're staying for X amount of days, yeah. you'll get a, a clean on the third day. Now, the higher end hotels, no, I do yeah. believe the, you know, have have the daily cleaning. Yeah. But the ones that are, are a little bit more, I'm putting it in Disney terms. So like your deluxe, your moderate, <laughs> or your values. Hey, the values are uh, going to do it there. Listen. That's the one some, thing about Disney is it's clean. solid value resorts. But I do believe in the grand scheme of things, the moderate and value res, um, hotels out there are not doing the daily cleaning, whereas you're going to find that in the more yeah. deluxe hotel. Or you're it just, it depends it. a lot on the owners and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, but, so there's a lot of other factors here. So again, you yeah. know, like Jason said at the top, you're going to take all of this but with a grain of salt. They, but speaking of, I mean, let's talk about Disney here. Yeah, I mean, speaking a, of Orlando. Here's a more realistic thing for a lot of people. Atlanta yeah. to Orlando. Now this one, they did actually do it based on a road trip because Atlanta to Orlando is not that far. You would probably drive uh, for four people for seven days. Total cost for travel, including driving in a family car and hotels, three thousand two hundred and sixteen dollars. Total cost for travel in a folding camping trailer, so a pop up, be seventeen hundred and twelve dollars. Of course, a lot of people want to travel in something. Uh, you know, you're that's the the cheapest RV out there is going to be a folding pop up but trailer. I, I think but, a number like this, when you see that one thousand yeah. seven hundred and twelve, I think for people coming into this, for people who are looking to just take that one big trip a year, yeah. maybe that a pop up trailer is actually a really good option because here you're talking about going to Orlando for seven days. Yeah. And you're spending seventeen hundred dollars well, when it comes to your fuel, when it comes to your campground, and then that allows families of four realistically yeah. to budget out, 
you know, epic universe is coming. <laughs> like well, all you, the things you, might, you do when you go to Orlando. And, well, I don't want to. I don't want to sound like we're shilling to for you to go buy an RV if you don't want own one already no, or something. But if you pick something like a pop up, and say you're going to spend about ten thousand dollars on a used one. And we always talk about how RVs depreciate so quickly, uh, particularly if you buy them new. Mm -hmm. So you go buy a $10,000 pop-up and you use that for a year, maybe two years, and it's used. Let's say it's used when you bought it, right? You go use it for a year or two and go on, let's say that's four vacations plus a a couple local weekends a year Mm -hmm. near your home. When you go to sell that, you're probably going to get eight or nine thousand dollars for that because it was already used. You've already taken the depreciation hit, unless you know, unless you did a lot of unless you, you did it real dirty and, and didn't it. take care of it. But um, <laughs> yeah, if you took take care of it, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna get most of that. Now, if you buy uh, a brand new three hundred thousand dollar motorhome and you go to try to sell that two years from now, you're not going to get three hundred thousand. You're not going to get two hundred and fifty thousand. You're not going to probably get 200,000 out of it. No, but this (sighs) is a really fascinating roundup. There's a couple of more examples on here that you can see in RV Today's articles. So just go over and pick up one of these digital subscriptions, pick up a print subscription. They're beautiful magazines or become a mile marker member and get the digital print subscription for free just by supporting RV miles because the people at RV today are awesome. And they support us by giving us that, uh, offer to give to you that beautiful perk that we can share to you. And we are excited to continue to collaborate with them, not only in their publication, but then also the value that we can bring to all of you here talking about articles like this. So pretty great. Go over and check it out. Chances are you've seen them on the road. That's because Blue Ox designs and manufactures the best towing products in the industry. Just look around. You'll find them on highways and campgrounds and anywhere you find people traveling in the great outdoors. Award-winning tow bars, base plates, and brakes. A full line of weight distributing hitches. Adjustable ball mounts and a new line of fifth wheel hitches. With Blue Ox, towing doesn't have to be a drag. To learn more about how Blue Ox can make your travel adventures even more stress-free, visit blueox.com. Get ready to use your outside voice. Whether you're camping at a local state park, driving cross-country to a music festival, or just want to try out the RV life before you buy, the adventure begins as soon as you step inside your RV share rental. Choose from thousands of options, including pet-friendly RVs and RVs that can be delivered right to your campsite. Each booking on RV Share also includes 24-7 roadside assistance for the ultimate peace of mind on the open road. With a wide-ranging inventory from affordable pop-up campers to luxury motorhomes, RV Share has a rental that is perfect for you. Book your RV now for the solar eclipse this April. There is still availability near the path of totality, and make sure to check out RV Share's Total Solar Eclipse RV Guide. Use promo code RVMILES30 for $30 off a $500 rental or more at RVShare.com. That's RVMILES30 for $30 off $500 at RVShare.com. All right, let's talk about anxiety uh, while driving an RV. (laughs) Let's pare that down. We're going to just talk about anxiety as it pertains to yeah, driving to uh, we're not RV. doctors we're not going to give you uh <laughs> nope. medical advice here no nope. but we, one of the most common questions we get is you've never driven an rv before how are you going to do this you're very scared you've never driven anything near that big you have no idea what you're getting into so that's one end of it but there's also you know when you've been doing it for many years some people are just anxious about something that big. And uh, sometimes that never goes away, right? So we're going to talk about some tips and tricks for relieving a bit of that anxiety so that you can feel a lot more comfortable, whether you're the driver or not. It could be for the passenger as well. Passengers can be very anxious about what the driver is doing. I know I am one of the ways I relieve any anxiety is by being the driver, <laughs> right? And it's this is not this has nothing to do with Abby. It doesn't matter who the driver is. I am always more comfortable in any vehicle if I'm in the driver's seat, right? And that might be, not be true for you, but for for me, it is. So that's one way I deal with it. Yes. Yeah, so when we put this together, when we discussed wanting to have this conversation, we wanted a why. Like, what is the big picture here that allows us then to filter out all of the tips to answer the 
the how of all of this or the yeah. why of all of this. And really it was, how do we set ourselves up for success? Yeah. Unfortunately, this? this is it, the, um, all our tips are going to be about preparation. So if you're a procrastinator, this, this, yeah. that, that's probably but one of the things that's causing your anxiety. Maybe we should do a procrastinators. <laughs> we could certainly talk about procrastinating, but uh, <laughs> you know, but what does that mean? Like, what does success mean? And I think yeah. we all will define success when it comes to overcoming something in a different way. You know, Jason off the bat drove a school bus from Ohio through Chicago back in 2016, having never been in anything that big for, before. Um, I, I wouldn't, I mean, I, had, I mean, you had towed things. Uh, so I had, were like, you a school bus driver? And I, I didn't un- know about it. Unfortunately, like for me, I, like my perspective on this is like, comes from when I was a teenager, my mom had a business that involved, my mom made, Costumes for country western dance competitions. I can't right now. And we we towed behind our uh, Chevy Astro minivan, the you know the light blue one that was very popular in the uh, in the eighties and nineties. Oh, 90s. for sure. We towed like a Hallmark trailer behind mm-hmm. that, uh, full of uh, all of her stuff, racks of clothing and and boots and all that sort of stuff to these different competitions, which were. Quite awesome, by the way, uh, around the Midwest. So from from here, we would travel to like Omaha or St. Louis. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, before I even officially had my driver's license, had my learner's permit, I was towing, right? So my mom actually was the one that taught me how to like back up a trailer and all that sort of stuff. And then in my theater days, uh, you know, I working a lot of like loadings and strikes, we would rent big enterprise trucks and stuff like that. So my experience is not what a lot of people are going to have. Yeah, so, but your experience is probably a lot more like what a lot of people will have going into it. Yeah. My parents weren't driving me around at 14 yeah. to sell Western wear. At, I was too busy in Renaissance festivals. <laughs> I was doing my own version of dress you're, up. You're, you're at home Renaissance festivals. <laughs> hey, no, my real me Shakespearean but, performance. But I don't will come say like to that. me, you know, to me from having that experience in the end, overall, like if you've never done this before, it's not that different from driving a small car. It just requires a lot more attention you need to, it requires a lot more, and this is not going to be a driving lesson here that we're doing on this episode, no. but it requires a lot more use of your mirrors. Um, it requires a lot more uh, just knowledge of your size, right? Mm-hmm. The, the I think the hardest thing for a lot of people is I can't see out the rear view mirror, right? It's, you're not weird. seeing out the window in the back, yeah. whether you have a trailer or a motor home, you're not really seeing out the back and that's a little weird for anybody, but one of the biggest tips we have for you, and I'm skipping ahead because it's not in the order here, but this, ahead. but this is related to this is don't be concerned about those people behind you. They so, don't matter. Let's back up a little bit though, before <laughs> well, we, yes, get we'll get to, get to that. that. So okay. Jason's experience has been quite extensive, even though, yes, he had never driven a school bus, but he had kind of that confidence level back in 2016 when we bought the bus to convert it and become RVers. And then from there, he continued moving into a towable. Then we had a fifth wheel. And then we went back to Bexy, what you all know from our Baja to Alaska last year, our 25 foot Ibex 20 BHS. My experience was very different. I have no towing experience when we got on the road. I didn't actually tow anything. It took six and a half years of full-time RVing before I finally started towing. And I didn't start towing until we had the 25-foot travel trailer. That is when uh, the stars aligned for me in a lot of different ways, mind over matter, all of that stuff that I finally felt comfortable enough. So these are two very different perspectives when it comes to towing an RV and not neither one is right or wrong. There's no right or wrong when it comes to towing. There is no timeline on this. You do it when you're confident and ready to do it because that's when you're going to yeah. have the most success. And I think for you, it was it was really came down to the size of what we were towing. Yes. And so that is, you know, I think the first thing, and we'll get to all of these, we've kind of broken them down, but I think really the first thing, so 
if you can. Now, I know a lot of us, like we did with the bus, you purchase it and the first time you you have it behind you or you are driving it is the day you take possession of it. But if you can, if you know someone who has an RV or you can get a little bit of time behind the wheel of one to practice beforehand, before you take that big trip or you even take that shakedown trip to the local campground, if you can get a little bit of practice time in an environment where you're not worried that you're going to hit someone, that you're going to go out of your lane, that someone's going to hit you, that you can kind of get all of those just so you can get a feel for how the rig behaves either with you at the wheel of it or with it behind you, yeah, that can really help alleviate some anxiety. If that's not a possibility, try to take a class. There are classes out there. Um, people, I think, don't even think about this existing sometimes, but there are classes that you can take. Um, FMCA they're, they're, offers one every time they do their rallies. They're not necessarily going to be near you, um, you know, depending on what your situation is. So yeah, there are groups like the family motor coach association, the FMCA, they do big rallies. Um, the, they're big ones twice a year and then they do some small ones and tied to those, they have driving schools. So you come a few days early and you go through an RV driving school. There are around the country, there are driving schools for, for commercial drivers, for semi trucks. Um, Often those schools will also have like uh, bus driver driving classes, uh, which you could, you know, if you're going to drive a class A motorhome would be good for you. And sometimes they even have RV driving classes attached to them. Uh, so those are some options for you. And some uh, RV shows, if you go to the big Florida RV super show that happens in Tampa, they have driving schools attached to that as well. So there are a few options out there. It's not ideal, but you can probably even locally hire just a, a single instructor, you know, somebody with a CDL to come give you some tips and advice on, on driving just for a day might help relieve a little bit of the discomfort that you have. Now, if that isn't something you're really interested in, or it's just not a possibility for you, then there's this wonderful little thing out there called YouTube yeah. and, and <laughs> you can, you now be very selective yeah about this, but there are videos out there that you can watch that will help give you some tips, some pointers, give you a, a bird's eye view, maybe a little bit of what it's like to drive. And we have a few suggestions. Um, the first one would be if you're looking for motorhome driving advice, we think the RV geeks have done a fantastic they, job. They actually, I watched videos of theirs when we started RVing for my own benefit. So yeah. they, you know, they, I have always lived in a big class A motor home. So their stuff is, is generally related to big motor homes, but they do, they do a great job with like drone shots and cones and parking lots to really give you an idea of like how to take a turn, where to take a turn, where, you know, how to, the turns are the hard part in all of this. So figuring out like what, sort of space you need and how to easily judge that stuff. They do a fantastic job of that. And I would really encourage this too for anyone that's going from a towable to a drivable or vice versa. Take yeah. some time to watch some videos. If you have, because turning a drivable, turning that bus was a way different experience yeah. than it was when we had a 43 foot fifth wheel. It happened to be a lot easier. Yes. Uh, so, and that's another thing like to, not to get off the, the topic here, but when you're choosing an RV, don't get bogged down into your opinions about what that might be like to drive. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people will look at, at a smaller class C motor home and be like, well, that looks a lot more manageable to me than that big giant class A. Not really true because a, a class C with that big overhang, it, it, it's not built in the first place to be to be a motor home. It was a truck or a van chassis. It's it's actually usually not as easy to drive as the big class A motor homes where you got a wonderful view. Uh, and same thing with trailers. A lot of people are like, I don't want one of those big honking fifth wheels. Those look like terrible to drive down the road. 
they actually drive a little bit easier than a standard travel trailer. So don't get bogged down into your interpretations of things before you know, learning from others. If Yoda has taught us anything, it's that yeah. size doesn't matter. Okay. <laughs> it, so. it, it does to an extent, but, but also, um, <laughs> the, the, uh, so given, getting back to the subject though, if you want to look for videos on towing, highly suggest looking into videos done by and for truck drivers. They're usually some of the best, especially if you're going to be driving a fifth wheel is a little bit different towing a conventional travel trailer, but a fifth wheel is going to is is going to turn and back up and operate pretty similar to a a, a standard commercial tractor trailer. And I would say too, when it comes to watching videos, um, there is if you see and watch a video where someone's information is so drastically different, really, really drastically different from the majority of information that you have read or already seen about towing this or driving this particular type of RV. I I would caution a little bit on that video that so drastically goes away from the yeah. norm. There is a very, these are all really very much built the same way. You just talked about these chassis, right? Yeah. They are for the most part there. It is just, it is just, it is just law. They're all going to turn in a really, this towable at this length is going to turn this really the different. same way as this towable brand in that same length. This motorhome brand is really going to turn the same as this motorhome brand. That is, that is really common. So just again, when you get out into the, the YouTube world, just really make sure that you're absorbing information from people that can really back up their experience yeah. with this topic. And, and, look, and a lot of really dumb people figure this out. You can figure you it can out. Figure it out too. You, you can do it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> as we alluded to at the top, it was six and a half years before I started towing, and then when we, I did start towing. I, I loved it. I love driving with the ibex behind us. I found a lot of joy in that, and this is, I think, the. It took me getting to the ibex to a, a size of a rig that I felt comfortable with. You know, prior to owning Bexie, we had had our school bus that was at forty feet. We had then moved into our Pioneer Travel Trailer, which was at 38. Then we went into our Sabre Fifth Wheel, which was at 43. And this next tip is really as you're looking at your next RV or your first RV, really think about the size of the length, the type of RV that you feel comfortable driving. Yeah. I felt comfortable at 25 feet. As we have now begun looking at what is that next rig for our family, now that we're no longer full timers, what is the next rig? We have really made a commitment to, if we're going to go fifth wheel, to go no bigger than 32 feet so that we can keep it at a length that I continue to feel comfortable towing. Because that's really, really important now that we be able to trade off on towing so that we can also continue to do work and things like that on our travel days. Yeah. So think about yeah. that. Think but about But again, don't just assume though that you know, like knowledge is power, right? A lot, right. a lot of managing anxiety for some people who have anxiety issues is once they know more, it helps relieve some of those things. So for instance, uh, again, like a, a short travel trailer that is only on one axle. Single axle trailers don't back up quite as well as a double axle trailer. So some of the, you know, once you get a little bit bigger, it might actually be a little easier to tow. Is there that much of a difference in towing between a 25 and a 32 foot trailer? Not really, but there is a, there, your, your comfort level and what you see does matter for and sure. And I think a lot of that too is the unit itself. There were things about the Ibex, particularly the independent suspension. Oh, so great. The made me feel confident in towing it. Yeah, and you, and and you had been riding uh yes. in the truck with me towing it and you saw how that 
went because the the independent suspension. Look, if you have an option to get independent suspension, get it 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 it, it, get re, it, it. gets rid of all of the sway concerns. Um, all of the, uh, it, even if you're not going to take it off road or anything like that, uh, I think a big concern with folks in towing is sway stuff mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. the hitch you get, uh, really matters a lot. You want it, you know, good weight distribution hitch. Um, although we didn't use one with the independent suspension, we didn't need it, didn't really feel the need for it, but we also are towing with an F-350 a trailer that a lot of people are towing with yeah. an F-150. <laughs> yeah. um, but the, we had more uh, the, truck your, for your, the trailer. <laughs> your tow vehicle is, is going to, your tow vehicle is going to make a huge difference in your anxiety. Yeah. If you are towing a large trailer with a small SUV, you're going to feel every, every semi truck go past you. Um, even if you're not swaying, you're, you're just going to feel it more. And that is just anxiety fuel. Anytime yeah. you feel that trailer go. It's incredibly stressful yeah. being the driver or even being the passenger because you know what is happening back there. And I think that that really fits into the whole conversation of pick the rig that's the right size for you. That goes with the tow vehicle that you're going to have with it. And the way that you set that up, because another kind of what goes with this is you also really need to be comfortable with hitching and unhitching that and how that all goes. You need to feel confident that, look, if you just mentally think, I feel more confident that this is safe if it's a towable versus a fifth wheel, or I feel more safe pulling my, you know, my drivable car around and being in the driver's seat of the RV, the mental of that is just as vital as all of that other information that goes with it. So for me, it was having the Ford F-350 with that Ibex behind it. And it was just a, it having a love of that truck and really believing, I mean, that truck will do anything and everything for us. It is yeah. such a great truck. And I, I think a lot of that went into what finally made it click for me and me say, yeah, I can do this because what I have, what I am surrounded with are, are components that I feel safe yeah. being and, using. And whatever you choose, or if you already have whatever you have, knowing it really well. So knowing the hitching procedure really well, uh, having your, your partner, if you've got one double checking everything, just having that all down solid is really vital because you don't want to be thinking about that while you drive. It's just another thing to nag at you while you drive. Mm -hmm. If you get to driving, you're like, Oh, I wonder if the, you know, the hitch is on right. Or if I, uh, if I, you know, locked the pin or anything like that, you should never have to be questioning whether you, you put the pin through the latch. Yeah. Right? You should know for sure that you've done that because you've gone and done a double check of it. You've built a system. You have a checklist maybe where you check those things off physically. So you can see checklists are great for anxiety. And then also for me, doing them in the same step every single time in the same pattern. Yeah. Even when we were, um, you know, in our 43, well, every single RV we've ever owned. So Jason has always been the outside. I've always been the inside. I have a very specific pattern that I start. I always move from the back of a rig and I move forward because most of the time the door is forward. So the last thing I'm dealing with, the last thing when I go out is closing the door. So I always start at the back of the rig and I just move forward. And then yeah. that I do that the same way every single time you should do that when it comes to that. I know that everything is safely where it needs to be. That is something that we adopted when it came also to towing as well. Jason had a very specific pattern that he moved through every single time. And then that gets in your body. And if you don't do the pattern right, you feel it and yeah. you know something's off. And, and whether you do, whether you have to do all those steps or not, you need to at least walk through them because where mistakes get made are when you stop at a rest area and mm -hmm. put the slide out or you stop for an overnight and you didn't unhook the trailer from the truck. That kind of stuff is where like 
you you feel like you're already connected, so you forget to do things. Yeah. You make those mistakes in those locations. So still having the checklist, going through it all, going walking, going through the motions like you pretended, pretend like you are going to do all the things that you would normally do. Um, that that can be extra important. Repetition, repetition, yeah. repetition. So the, all right. The next big thing though that really makes all the difference in the world when it comes to anxiety is uh, again setting yourself up for success by not giving yourself the pressure of getting somewhere by a certain time. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely essential for, I think for anybody, but for especially somebody that feels anxiety about driving an RV to not be pressed to get to a campground by a certain hour and have to drive a certain speed to get there. You want to have the time and freedom to be able to take your time getting ready to go. You need to leave by 8 a.m. and you're really rushing to get out by 8 a.m. so that you can get somewhere at a certain time. That can cause problems. Or you're really rushing to get out of the campground by checkout time, 11 o'clock or something like that. That can cause problems. You want to have the freedom and the time to do all the steps that you need to take. Plan it to take twice as long as it, it normally does. Um, because problems do arise and you want to have the space for those problems to come up. Yeah. The first few times that you tow, don't do those on long drive day. Don't plan a 300 mile drive day if you and can. For us, 300 is long. Yes. For a lot of people, that sounds so short. Yeah. But 300 feels very long for us. Well, I think, you know, we add 15 minutes to every hour that the GPS gives us yeah. as arrival time. And I would even say that for when you have more than two people and then you start adding in a third person yeah. and a fourth it's person more. and a fifth person, yeah. that really starts to creep up some of your time. And also we learned very quickly that it does nobody any good if we are miserable and stressed and just, we don't enjoy, it's about just, we, yeah. it's about the journey just as much as the destination, right? We don't enjoy the journey if it's like, go, 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 go. No, we can't stop. No, we can't stop yeah. for this. You miss so much. That's the whole point of RVing is that yeah. freedom to be able to, cool, this looks awesome. Let's stop for a second and check it out. Yeah. You now, know? The, the caveat to this, giving yourself the plenty of time, is that it's, you still do want to arrive by by light. While yeah, it's still, don't arrive in the dark. While it's still light. And, and arriving, <laughs> yeah. by, arriving while it's light, say the sun goes down at 530 or something. Uh, you know, obviously, depending on the time of year, time of year. But the sun's going down at 530. We're wanting to arrive by 330 because, again, something can come up. Right. I just don't want to arrive at dinner time. Yeah. Well, that you, too. With, I, with, with the kids, it's like a family <sighs> arriving at the campground at dinner time and trying to set up the camp while all the small people are, I'm hungry. I'm hungry. What's for dinner? What's for yeah. dinner? If you, it's it, just a recipe I, I, for disaster. For, for me, and I, I think a lot of people, and some people don't care. Uh, for me, driving an RV at night, trying to find a campground down some dumb county road where there's a tiny little sign. And then once you get into the campground, trying to find your campsite, trying to back in, it's, ju it's just miserable to do that in the dark when you can't see your rig in your mirrors. Well, and I think this leads really into knowing your route in advance. How do you take that pressure yeah. off of you too? know your route in advance? Don't just trust your GPS. Uh, you, you know, put, put the route in your GPS the night before, take a look at all the things that are going to happen on that route. Know the turns that you're, you know, get just a rough idea. You don't need to know everything, but just get a rough idea of the turns you're going to take, how many hours it's going to be, all that sort of stuff, instead of just, okay, it's time to go. Let's put it into the GPS and go. Yeah, Because go. we've done both. Yeah. And that latter one, that makes for even the most seasoned RVers, that makes for stressful days. Take a look at the campground's website. They will often have information about uh, GPS you know, is going to try to take ignore you ignore the GPS. Go this route, you know, make this turn here. The or or some just tips and tricks about you know you want to use this entrance uh, to the campground. There are two, but if you're arriving with your rig, you want to pull into this entrance. Or don't go down this road. There, they'll they will usually have some tips like that. If 
those things are a challenge in that area. And some of the worst anxiety moments happen when you're close to the campground, yeah. when you're trying to find it, when you're trying to make those turns in town and stuff, all that, all that sort of thing. And know what types of drives that you like to make. Cause for some people it's different. I prefer interstates. I feel like I've got plenty of room on an interstate um, and I feel like I don't have to worry about things like overpasses. I'm not like uh, stopping at a bunch of stoplights and making turns through town and stuff like that. But for some people, some people prefer the slower pace of of taking some of the state and county highways that are maybe two lane roads and all that sort of stuff. And again, I think it depends a lot on the size of your rig as well, too. Some if you're in a big 43 foot fifth wheel turns all over the place going through to, cause you know, a lot of the state highways go through towns, like every, yeah. you know, every 20 miles you're hitting a town and you're making turns and stuff like that. If you're in a camper van, that might be great for you. For me, I, I don't love that. I really loved cutting my teeth, uh, through Canada and into Alaska, getting on those two lane highways and having the availability to have all these pull-offs all the time. So I always felt like if I needed to stop, we could stop. It was very quiet. There wasn't sort of the hustle and bustle of interstates where you're dealing with semis and you're dealing with, you know, traffic, local traffic yeah. as well. There, It was very quiet. And often, you know, we would go long stretches really before we would see another car. And either. I think that was the key to it though, because yes. if we were on a road like that in the lower 48, that was busy, it would be very stressful. You would have had some stress about the people behind you yes. and wanting to like take pull off to yes. let them by and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. I think one of the greatest personal gifts I was given from that Baja to Alaska was the ability to get into some of these really remote places that allowed me to build my confidence yeah. as a, a driver, uh, with the RV. And that's, a, that's another thing I love about interstates is I'm never worrying about the person behind me. You, yeah. you should try to, that's, that's something a lot of people worry about. And that's something you should try to just let go of in the first place. Uh, but when you're on a two lane road, if you, if traffic is backing up behind you, it does get concerning. And there are some States where there's laws about, you have to pull over and let them by. And you should, of course, but I, I, you know, on a multi-lane interstate, if I'm just traveling in the right lane, I'm never, I know yeah. anybody can pass me. You don't have to go fast. There are some people out there that think that you have to keep with the speed of traffic. Even if everybody's going 80 and the speed limit 65, that everybody should be going 80. That is not true. Mm -mm. You need to be going a safe speed. Obviously you shouldn't be doing like, you know, 45 on the interstate, but it is okay if you are driving on an interstate that has a 65 mile an hour speed limit or even a 75 mile an hour speed limit to be going 63 miles an hour. Yeah. It's okay. Absolutely. Just stay out of the left lane. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just stay out of my way so that when I'm in the car yeah. that can go 75, 80 miles and an hour, I can go into that lane. We can safely all continue on our way. I mean, there's I'm, a reason why interstates have their multi-lane interstates. I mean, that's yeah. why. You just, you, you got to stop worrying so much about other people. You're driving in that right lane. You're worried a lot about people coming on, on, on ramps. It is their job to find the space in between. Now you can be nice and you can yeah, please be nice. You can move over and make room. If you can move over and make room, you can speed up or slow down a little bit in order to leave a bigger hole. But if it can't happen, you just continue on. That person might even have to stop. If you're in Oklahoma city, they will. <laughs> But, Love you, Oklahoma but it is, City. it is not the other drivers um, need to be less of a concern for you, um, especially if you're worried about, you know, what you look like. You know, don't I mean, and yeah, it's, it's, fine. It, it's a lot of people have these concerns. I know I have in the past, but you, you, those are the earliest things to try to let go, I think, to help reduce anxiety. Did you know that eTrailer.com is focused on putting actual hands on the products they sell. That allows the representatives to see, touch, and know exactly what it is like to use the product they're providing you with quality service and recommendations based on personal experience. If you're looking for a one-stop shop, 
eTrailer.com has you covered with a variety of RV items, including towing options, interior accessories, replacement parts, storage, and more. Have you ever wondered where you can find some of the odd parts for your RV online? eTrailer.com is where you do it. Visit RVMiles.com slash eTrailer and receive free shipping on orders over $99. That's RVMiles.com slash eTrailer. RV Miles is sponsored by Harvest Hosts. Harvest Host is a membership that allows RVers to take a rest from the road and enjoy unlimited overnight stays at over 5,100 unique locations in North America. Breweries, farms, attractions, wineries, and more. Want to check out the 2024 solar eclipse on April 8th but don't have a place to stay? Harvest Host has over 500 locations in the path of totality. Easily plan and book your next RV trip and enjoy over $1,500 in exclusive member benefits by joining Harvest Host. Get 15% off your first year of membership with the code MILES. That's M-I-L-E-S. Go to harvesthost.com to become a Harvest Host member today. Let's kind of start to wrap this up. There's about two more things on here that we want to touch on really quick. And uh, I'm just going to read this one out. And it is really to have a game plan actually inside the cab as well, inside the R- either inside the RV or inside your tow vehicle, have a game plan in there. Um, you know, if you're traveling with multi, you know, multiple people and this is your first time towing or your second time and you've got kids in there with you and you've got your partner in there with you, uh, have the snacks ready. Really try to create an environment that is going to make you successful as the driver. There is nothing worse than trying to be the driver, navigating what's going on for the first, second or third time staying in your lane, checking everything. And it is just friggin' chaos. Let the kids look at their devices. Le- Do uh, it. <laughs> and take it from us. Cause we have had the chaos there. Ha- there was a time when I was towing that the kids, ah, man, they just, it was stop touching me. Stop touching me. Stop. It did not matter. Did not matter. And I finally was like, Everybody stop <laughs> just screamed really loud. And I was like, I am trying to drive. You know? <laughs> and because it was just so intense. And that is when accidents happen. Now, hopefully your people will not get to that level, but everyone gets there at least once in their lives when, especially when you've got kids in the back seat. So if you can, set yourself up for success. And if you don't have the chorus behind you in the tow vehicle, but there are things you can do, like make sure you have uh, the RV miles podcast downloaded and ready to play, uh, get your, your music going, get an album on that you like your audio book, have all of those things ready, have a drink at hand, your snacks at hand so that you are able to create an environment that works for you inside And finally, the very last thing we can say here, and then we're going to move on, is it's okay to say no if you don't want to tow. Just say no. (laughs) I didn't mean for that to be a rhyme. Obviously, if that's that's possible in your situation sometimes. Yeah, this is really coming from a a two-person. And what I wrote is if you have a partner or you are traveling with uh, someone else, that is comfortable with towing. Yeah. It's okay for you as long as you both are are in agreement with that. It is it is okay to not tow. You're not you're not doing anything wrong. You're not pulling less weight. You're not. Yeah. There's there's not being and the passenger, there, being like the co pilot to the driver is a really really important job. And we always think it's it's smart for if you're if there are two of you for you both to know how to drive the rig yeah but knowing how to drive the rig in an emergency situation doesn't mean that you're like practicing all the time right so if you if you're just if this is just not you if you don't want to be the driver that's fine know how to drive it if somebody breaks their leg or something but you i promise you you will figure that out once that happens and, and it will be fine. You don't need to be taking 20% of the drives just because you want to stay on top of it. And uh, we if you say that, that you can. we say that because we were the people on the other end. Yeah. 
where we got into a medical situation where the only person in our party who knew how to do a bulk of the things with the rig was currently in the hospital and I did not. And, um, in fairness, we had only had that set up for about a month. Yeah. In fairness, (laughs) but, um, we were getting there. You hadn't even driven the truck yet. No, I hadn't done anything. We We had just got back on the road. You never drove the bus. Um, and you had never driven the truck. We, we, so we'd moved to our travel trailer. You had never even gotten into the uh, yeah. driver's seat of the truck yet. So, you know, thankfully, um, we had a support system around us that yeah. was able to help me confidently learn the things I needed to learn in order, uh, in such a high pressure situation. And I would say in a high pressure situation, if you can lean on someone, uh, that can help you with that, because again, that's when accidents yeah. can happen because your mind is all over the place in a situation like that. So, but it is okay. After everything we just talked about, It is okay to not be the person that is constantly towing or driving the RV. That that is totally fine. You are not a less person in this RV experience. Like I said, co-pilots have a lot of value. I mean, who is going to open the snacks? If who is going to put... I would rather rather drive than deal with the kids. That's for sure. Yeah. Who (laughs) is going to keep the chorus back there? from just blasting us with sound. So there's a lot of, of value there in the co-pilot. And I'm better at tuning everybody out. So. Yeah, but you know what? Maybe there's some suggestions to some tips yeah. and tricks that we didn't, you know, again, we don't know everything. So maybe you have something that you could share as well. We would love to hear that. You can leave it if you're watching this on YouTube. Please share it with us in the description for the video. If you're listening to this and you want to come over and share this tip in the RV Miles Facebook group, that would be great. If you can share that and help someone else build confidence that maybe your tip will resonate with them more than anything that we said. So we would love to know your thoughts and opinions on what we just shared here. All right, it is time to check the level of our tanks. And as always, this is sponsored by our friends over at Liquefied RV Toilet Treatment, the no BS toilet treatment. Go over and check them out and support our sponsors by going to liquefiedrv.com. Okay, Jay, what is in your black tank this week? It is April 2nd, so my black tank is, uh, as we record this, this isn't coming out on April 2nd, but uh, my black tank is bound to be April Fool's jokes. I used to love April (laughs) Fool's jokes. And then social media came along. (laughs) It's... Brands have ruined April Fool's Day. Brands have... They either do the lamest, dumbest April Fool's jokes. So, so dumb. Or like ridiculously believable ones that aren't funny, that are just fooling people for the sake of fooling them. Like, the, and the thing about social media too is like a lot of folks are like they make an April Fool's Day joke at the beginning of the day. It gets shared around all over the internet, and then then they don't say anything about it till the next day. The thing when I was a kid about April Fool's Day is like you'd make a joke at somebody, you'd trick them into believing something. And like 30 seconds later, April Fool's, right? The, well, there's already so much misinformation on the internet. AI art made it really annoying because now brands can like just make up photos of things and stuff. You can count me among the throngs of folks that hate April Fool's Day now. Uh, this whole period of year, I don't like St. Patrick's Day. I don't like April Fool's oh, Day. Oh, stop it. Easter's stop not it. really my thing. Oh, my no. goodness. Wow. I'm sorry, I'm a party I know. Pooper. My goodness. Like, spring is not your deal, Valentine's I guess. Valentine's Day. Oh, my goodness. Wow. It's, it's so be- Christmas is so great. And then you get. You are just living for camping season. <sighs> yeah. Once the beginning of the year starts. Yeah. I will agree with you to an extent. I do appreciate. President's Day. What the heck? Once President's Day. Oh my gosh. Sorry. Flag Day. <laughs> Jason. Do you, do you know the origin of bulk of these holidays? Well, half of them are Hallmark holidays. Yeah. The other half, I, there's some great reasons for some of these holidays. Mm-hmm. And I, uh, you know, Memorial Day is really important to me, mm-hmm. and I think uh, I think holidays should feel important. Um, 
I, I know, and I, obviously I know the, the religious importance of Easter, mm -hmm. but um, uh, to me growing up, Easter wasn't the, the, the thing, right? Yeah. And I, and that was even as a church going kid, Easter just wasn't the thing. You know, yeah. I also grew up living in Chicago through my twenties and working in a theater attached to two bars, things like St. Patrick's day and fat oh. Tuesday. Oh, Oh, any excuse to go to the bars. I mean, yeah, I, I get it. There are a lot of holidays Did not, that could not stand the people in the neighborhood at that I, time. I get it. I can't say that I am with you on all of yeah. the other holidays that you did list, but I will say that I did find a few April Fool's posts yesterday to just be in really, really bad taste. Yes. I yeah. felt like they were really trying to emotionally manipulate people and they did not ever clarify that it was April Fool's. There was nothing even in the comments that said, fooled you, like nothing. And that just, I'm I'm not here for that. I do love a good, I mean, I, I vividly remember the April Fool's joke that my parents pulled on us kids. I still remember that joke to this day. I think it's fun. Now, obviously we're a joking family. A lot of people really raked us across the coals for the, way that we revealed Ethan's, you know, Christmas gift to him. They yeah. didn't find it funny, but uh, he found it great. He's a jokester. And then we, we played on that with him and he had a great time. We didn't harm, like it was nothing malicious. Like he was fine. Just, but, but we used to write articles more than we do now. Yeah. And when we did, if we did an April Fool's article, I, I enjoyed doing that a little bit. But by the end of it, you knew for sure that it was an April Fool's it's joke. It's so outlandish. Like, it's just you might, it's so you, outlandish. What we would try to do is you would be fooled maybe for the first two or three paragraphs. And then by the time you got to the end, you're like, oh, geez, okay. April Fool's has just become like the clickbait holiday. Because it's brands that are just like, oh, we can get social media exposure by doing this. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's just not fun anymore. It's, it's, it's not working for you. Fun. All right. What is in your fresh tank this week? So, te well, you know, we have a Tesla. Uh, our second car is a Tesla. Yeah, like I, shocking. I'm sure everyone knows that uh, by now. <laughs> and Tesla this month has given everybody that owns a Tesla a free month of their full self-driving. It costs a lot of money to get the full self-driving, but all the cars are equipped with the ability to do that. But you have to pay either $12,000 when you activate it or $200 a month. So it's not something we're going to pay for. But it's fun that we've been able to play with it a little bit. And it's gotten me a little excited about the future because I you know, I know it's something that concerns a lot of people. Um, and I have concerns about it as well. But I truly think when cars are more autonomous, not yet, when this technology improves a little bit, um, and it's way further along than I, I would have ever thought it was, that I think our roads are going to be way safer. And I know people are concerned. People are like, well, you can't make me have a self-driving car because, uh, you know, I'm a safer driver. That's fine. I, th I think you should always have the ability to drive yourself. And I think cars will be that way forever, that you that they're not going to make you have it drive you wherever you want to go. But I, I think... Just having driven it, seeing, being able to have the confidence like on the screen of seeing what it sees, what it knows, how it knows how to take a turn, all that sort of stuff. It's clunky. It kind of drives like a scared teenager a I little hate bit. It. And I hate it, it. It, 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 it's, it's, it gives you a little motion sickness if you're driving. I, it's not something that I want to use right now. No, really. we will not. I, be I've played around with it. it. <laughs> but knowing how far it's come in a few years and how far it might come in the next few years, I just think. Like I will use it. I, I don't like we're driving around a city. I have no use for it there, but like driving on the highway where you just lock it in and it, it's going to uh, basically be like cruise control, but it is also doing some of the turning for you. You have to keep your hand. There's so many safeguards that people don't, if you don't understand, if you haven't looked into this at all, the safeguards are the reason people aren't using it. I'll be honest mm -hmm. because the, there's a camera looking at your face. Uh, so if your your face moves away from the windshield for too long, 
uh, you know, more than 10 seconds or so, it's going to start yelling at you. And eventually it, it very quickly, it will pull over uh, on you and it will disengage. And then it will not allow you to use self-driving anymore for the next like few drives or something like that. And if you do it too many times, it won't let you ever use it again. You get put in timeout. It requires it in Tesla's not now, not all brands are like this. Some brands allow you to put your hands on your lap or something. Tesla's require you to have your hand on the wheel. Um, so it, it feels the weight of your hand and you can pull it off for bits, but you have to have your hands on the wheel. Um, stuff like that. I think about drunk drivers, not that anybody should ever be drunk driving. And I, of course I don't want a self-driving car to be an excuse for somebody to be able to drink and drive. But I think about the number of lives saved. I mean, do you, do folks realize how many people die a year on American roads? I mean, I think it's like 35,000 people you a year. attempting to now keep me from being able to get on the roads without oh, sorry. completely sorry for filled, it, filled with anxiety? Fill anxiety so here. maybe let's just, let's just be, this is supposed to be a fresh tank, Jason. I just, <laughs> and you're turning no, it I, into a I, black tank. I have a, it, it is, <laughs> I, and I know a lot of people, I know a lot of people don't like the, the safety nanny things that are getting put on vehicles. Uh, that will always be the case. People hated seatbelts when they came out. But I tr I truly think we are looking down the barrel of a future where driving will become immensely safer, where the cars can talk to each other and know where they are on the road. I, I, I have a lot of hope for what the future of driving looks like. I... Agree with you in a lot of points. I when I said I hate it, it is because um, you hate it's, being in it when it's happening. It's yeah. very yeah, it's very clunky. It's got a long way to go. Still, there's a lot of safety measures. I like when, about it. There's, but it's uh, from a a driving standpoint. The the way it over accelerates, you know, when it uh, is inter in ramps onto the highway. The sort of uh, just the clunkiness of it. Uh, I got. Car sick. I mean, I already have a little bit of an issue with the regenerative braking. I have yeah, the Tesla. The, I was talking about some talking about this with somebody else on social media this morning. Yeah, that it, a lot of people get a little car sick in electric cars because they decelerate. Yeah, instead it's, of coast. Yeah, it's aggressive, yeah. and so I think that those are just some tweaks. Those are. Um, I, I don't think they're minor tweaks. I think they're actually really big tweaks. But they're like adjustable. Weapon, they but are they're things adjustable. that can yeah, be tweaked. It's, yeah. The technology is here to do it. It yeah. just needs a little bit more time, which is why I just don't think it's worth two hundred dollars no, a month right now. Yeah, it's a novelty. It's like a, a you know, it's a parlor trick right now. Yeah. Um, that said, though. Man, it parks that thing so oh. sweet. That oh, that parallel parking. But I worry at the same time. Will the next generation then of drivers not know but, how to parallel park? That's absolutely. Not, there will be we, a, a a period of time where people are going to be we can't terrible drivers yeah, without it. Yeah. We can't lose those skills. Yeah. I am I am having my kids learn cursive writing. And I think part of that is so that they know how to sign we're, a form. We're such, to, on, we're such on the line of like, the, that sort of Gen X, oh, early yeah. millennial, where we sound like the get off my lawn people. Get off my uh, lawn. But we are also like, oh, yeah, full self-driving cars is great. Listen, there are young people 20 years younger than us that are buying hardcore into uh, the homesteading type yeah. ideas. There's so much sourdough starter out there in the world right now, Jason. Well, the internet has made that possible. There was a time where it was hard for people to get that information. But there is also right? a whole generation that is rejecting social media yeah. at this point that I think that there is a, there can be a balance between all of those things. We can have self-driving cars and also be good drivers. Right, right. Knowledge is power. My yeah. kids should know how to sign their name beyond just script. I guess just to put a button on it here though, when I have used it, you know, I'm, I'm basically using it without anybody else in the car because I don't get car sick never like that. When I'm using it, I feel like a safer driver. I'm not looking, I'm not just like reading a book or something. It is, <laughs> it is taking some tasks away from me 
Yeah. And I've got my hands on the wheel and my foot is ready to go at any time to take over. And I do have to take over often, but I am seeing more, paying attention to more Yeah, when I'm yeah. using it. And I found that interesting. I didn't expect that. All right. What is in your black tank this week? Uh, look, we all know our healthcare system in this country is a friggin' hot mess. It is a dumpster that has been on fire for a long, long time. This is, this is not surprising. Okay. I recently needed to find a new primary care physician, a PCP family doctor. We switched uh, insurance, we switched at, the, insurance. At, the, at the beginning of the year. And also I have spoken about how unhappy I was with my last doctor who told me she had time to hear two things. And if I needed anything more, I had to make an appointment. That is just not the kind of, you know, I don't want to go in there and talk about really personal, intimate things with someone who's like, oh, yeah, so I got to go. Uh, so I've been looking and I I had, a, you know, I've been doing enough research on what I'm trying to take care of that I had a, a kind of an idea of the type of doctor, family doctor I would like to see. Um, I had a very long list. I wasn't just saying I only want to see these two doctors. Uh, I went through the two different healthcare hospital systems, major healthcare systems here in the Quad Cities, and I uh, walked away with about four doctors that are currently accepting new patients out of dozens upon dozens upon dozens, and none of them could see new patients until the end of the summer. It's crazy. And so I... Thankfully, I ended up calling one doctor's office, um, and it was the doctor that I was really hoping I could have a relationship with. I really liked everything that I had learned about this doctor, and then talking to the receptionist really confirmed it. It was the first time anyone took some time to actually talk to me on the phone and kind of find out like what kind of doctor am I needing, and knowing the history of the doctors that they work with, would they be a good fit for me? Um, it was the first time after spending three hours calling that anyone was actually taking the time to listen to me. And then she sat there and went through this doctor's schedule day by day by day, trying to find an opening for me. And she was able to find the soonest opening she was able to find for me is July 1st. And so of course I took it and she kindly has put me on a, a call list, a wait list yeah. call list. Um, so hopefully they will call me sooner. I, it's just, it's amazing. I, it I, is. I, it's a real problem. Yeah. It's a real problem. Our healthcare in this country is a real problem. Our access to healthcare at, at all levels. Like I, this is, it's blowing my mind, you know? And so I, I'm just, it's a, it's a black tank to that. It's a black tank that, um, we have a system that is so strained, a healthcare system that is so strained that we cannot even provide just basic care for, we're all told to take care of ourselves. Yeah. And then we got to do X, Y, and Z. We should do all these things. And here's all the preventative care. And here's all, you know, you got to get your teeth cleaned every six months. I can't even get into a dentist for the next year. I'm supposed to do all of these things, but I, I can't yeah. because there's, there's no place for me. That's so yeah, black tank, Even black tank, black tank. You have insurance. You're willing to pay for it. You still can't. You still can't do anything service. with it. But we make people feel uh, really, really bad for, because they don't carry insurance. Yeah. But then it's like, what's the friggin' point? Well, and I, it, when, sorry, I, this of course, is, then I, people just go I'm, to the hospital. You know, they've got a problem. They go to the hospital because the hospital has to take them. So it it, it yeah. just feeds the problem, makes it worse. It's it makes it's everything very, more expensive and all that. Yeah, it's very frustrating. All right, what is in your fresh tank this week? I want to give a fresh tank to the RV Technical Institute. So I've talked a little bit. We've both talked a little bit in the past that we really need to start elevating and celebrating uh, trade work. We need to make that something that's just as important and has just as much respect as those who go off and pursue higher education at a four year that go off, get their master's or their doctorate. Yeah. Although if you do want to be a doctor, you probably... <laughs> <laughs> start now. Okay. Cause we need, you know, just go ahead and have our children start the medical training so that by the time they're old enough, I can get in to see one. Yeah. So I just really want to give this to RV technical Institute because, uh, I just saw this article that came out and in 
association with the RV Women's Alliance, they are doing uh, for the second year an all women's class schedule to become an RV tech. So they started this in 2023. It was really successful for them. And they're bringing it back again this year. There is a focus on getting women to come more into this industry. I think I read something that there's only about 2% of RV technicians are women. And so there is this desire to really want to grow that number, though over they had 30% of people interested in taking an RV Technical Institute training course have been women. So this is, I just think this is super cool that they're working to bridge this gap and to, again, you know, make trade work, make, if we want to call it blue collar work, Something that well, you we can should make a lot of money as an RV technician too. Oh I mean, heck, goodness. yeah! I mean, uh, but also it, we need these people. I think again, if the you know if the pandemic taught us anything, it is that ascent, we didn't realize how essential our essential workers were until we needed them to do all of these, keep all of these things. We needed people to keep coming to pick up our trash. Yeah. We needed janitors to keep cleaning our toilets. You know, we needed these jobs that I think have been looked at as as so lower. We needed people in the grocery store to keep putting the toilet paper on the, you know, on the shelves so we could all fight over it. You know, I mean, we, I, so I, we need essential workers. We need people in trade and we need to respect those jobs and we need to make those jobs accessible to all people. And so I just, I really applaud the RV technical Institute and for doing this and and offering these women focused classes. And because, you know, you know, you might say, well, why is it just for women only? But, you know, sometimes putting women in the room together, they're being able to see others like you doing this thing and to have that is empowering. Yeah. It's well, very we empowering. All, we know how men can get in situations like that. If women can feel more comfortable asking the questions, being in the room with a group of all women, it's it's fantastic. A group of all women. I think that the same can be said for people of color, for minorities yeah. to walk into a room and not be the only minority in that room. That speaks volumes to your confidence level. And so I just, I really, uh, I just wanted to give them my fresh tank this week because I think it's great. And if you are listening to this and you're a, a female and you're interested in perhaps becoming an RV tech, go over and check out these classes. They have several that are in person, but they also do their level two as a hybrid. So obviously you'd have to do level one first, but they are doing them in different places across the country. Denver, Colorado, they're doing one in Elkhart and also in Hershey, Pennsylvania during the Hershey RV show. Yeah. So lots of great opportunities there. All right, that's it for this week's episode of the RV Miles podcast. Yes, it is. And of course, if you have any thoughts or opinions on everything we talked about on this episode, we would love to hear them. Just head over to the RV Miles Facebook group and share your thoughts there. Or you can send them to us privately over at editor at rvmiles.com. And of course, if you enjoy RV Miles, if you're watching this on YouTube, please consider hitting that like and also subscribe to the channel. Or if you're listening to this, consider heading over to Apple Podcasts and leaving us a five-star review. All of those really simple things help put us in front of a whole new generation of RVers. So thank you to all of you who continue to support us that way. Uh, Until next week, stay safe, stay healthy. Hopefully you are somewhere warmer where it's not still snowing. It's snowing so hard right now. It is snowing so hard behind us. (laughs) Go over and watch this on YouTube. I don't know if you can see it, but... I can see it in the monitor. monitor. So that's how hard it is snowing. Either way, please keep logging those RV miles. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.